Well, I hope you were able to be here last weekend and uh, hear Marcus Warner speak or participate in one of the conferences that he did. I always appreciate Marcus because uh, really his ministry is special. He does a lot with spiritual warfare, and you won't encounter people who have a real balanced perspective on that very often. And he, in my opinion, has such great wisdom. I know that uh, some of the people here had really life-changing experiences through listening to him, and so I appreciate him very much. And then two weeks ago when I last taught, we were addressing men primarily, and I had said that I was going to do that in the month of January leading up to this men's conference that we just did. But then I really feel in praying about this that the Lord wants me to continue primarily to speak to men over the next few weeks. Now, as you, if you've been here, you know that the topics I'm addressing, though, are very applicable to women. It's not that I'm in some way uh, uh, neg neglecting you, but really the focus is to ask men to examine their hearts and see where, where they are in their walk with Christ. And now two weeks ago, I entitled the teaching Hero Worship. And it was based on the scripture in Exodus, which is one of the commandments that says, Honor your father and your mother so that, it may so that you may live long in the land. Or another version in another part of the scripture says, so that it may go well with you. And that is that in honoring your parents, there is a blessing that comes. And what I said in talking about this two weeks ago is that I really don't think you have to instill into a very small child a desire to honor their parents. That this God-given desire that he puts in each of us to worship him, that is to worship God the Father, starts out with this expectation about something special about your own parents. Because really for a two- or three-year-old child, their father is sort of God in their eyes. And so I use this little example from my own experience in life that this is about 15 years ago, if you were here you saw this, that this is my oldest son when he was maybe three or so, and I was building a room onto the back of our house. And, and that's me in the background there doing the work. And you see, what had happened was he dressed up to be just like that, <laughs> except for he had more hair than I did even at that time. But now nobody had to say, look, you're going to have to do this or anything like that. He just naturally went and grabbed his little plastic toys and hammers and so forth and, and came out and started imitating dad. And now at that age, that is such a natural thing, is it not? And it's not only for boys, but little girls do it of their dads and their moms and so forth. There's this thing about they're special, I want to be like them. And I believe that God has orchestrated it that way. He's planned it that way because first in learning to experience something with your own family then the goal is that you would transition into wanting to be like God the Father. You know, the scripture says that we should come to him like little children. And really, just as a little child would like to be like his dad, it is appropriate that an adult man or woman would want to be like God the Father. And that's the transition. That's the goal. But as we talked last week, there are lots of things that can, or two weeks ago, there are lots of things that can create a division between a parent and a child. And we said these four things particularly, selfishness, immaturity, rebellion, and sinfulness. All of us are born with a sin nature, so by definition, there are going to be conflicts and problems in our relationships, and that's true between parent and child. And I said, of course, any of those can be on the part of the child, that they can be selfish. Certainly, we're born self-centered, and, and we see the world in our own little eyes as if everybody is there for our purposes. But I said, not only is that a potential for division on the part of the child, but also on the part of the parent, particularly the father. Now, this is one of the things that we were talking about here Friday evening when we had our, our men's event. We were talking about the fact that there are lots of adult males who are really boys. That is, they haven't yet become men. And to a large extent, to the, the measure that I'm still selfish, immature, rebellious, and sinful, I'm still a boy. And it really does require that I take responsibility for my own actions and grow in maturity in order that I become a man. 
And sometimes there are great divisions that develop between parent and child, and the primary fault is with the parent. And if that has been the case in your situation, then it is your responsibility to bring healing and reconciliation. Let me say this. In any conflict or any division, ultimately, the responsibility for reconciliation rests upon the more mature person. Do you understand that? In other words, if, if uh, you're dealing with somebody who's a brand new Christian and you've been walking with Christ for 20 years and there's a conflict between you, the primary burden is on the person who is more spiritually mature because you need to have the wisdom to walk through their mess to help them in reconciliation. And so if you have been the immature one, you need to work toward a goal of healing. But if you are the person who has the higher level of maturity, you need to apply wisdom to bring reconciliation. Now, where I want to go this week continues upon that. We're still in Exodus. I really didn't set out to do a teaching on the Ten Commandments, but in talking to men, I ended up in this thing about the Ten Commandments. And so here in Exodus 24, it says that you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven or above or on the earth or beneath in the waters, that you shall not bow down to them or worship them. And it says, for I, the Lord, your God, that he is a jealous God. Now, first of all, you'll notice I underline things in heaven and earth and waters and so forth. Now, the fact is that human beings create idols of many, many things. Now, you probably don't think in those terms. You don't wake up and look around at your, your survey of life and say, oh, I have an idol here and an idol there and so forth. We tend to think of idols as something that was done, the, those things that were done in ancient history where there was a, a sun goddess. So, you know, that would be like worshiping something in heaven or there was a moon goddess or something like that. Or there were these pagan temples that were put up and people worshipped those. And we think of those as idols. But in reality, anything that pulls us away from true focus and true worship upon God, that anything of that nature can become an idol. Do you realize that all of the things of this creation are intended for our good, and kept in balance and used according to God's plans and purposes, they are good. However, almost anything can become an idol. And you know, you can measure something as to whether or not it's an idol by how much it consumes your life. In other words, does it consume your time? Does it consume your resources, your money, whatever other resources you may invest in it? Does it consume your focus? And you see, like, like take, for example, exercise. Well, it's good that we exercise, right? Obviously, the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's good that we take care of our body. But if you become obsessed with a certain form of exercise and it consumes all of your life, even to the point where your body begins to break down from excessive exercise, then that has become an idol. And sometimes it happens without us even realizing it. I mean, I've been involved in a variety of things that I enjoyed in recreation over the years. And as I look back at those, I realize that at times, without even thinking about it, they became a bit of an idol. I liked it too much, and it took too much of my time. And so the warning here is that we would not allow anything in this creation to become something more important than God himself. Now that's an interesting scripture where he says he is a jealous God. And I think it's a bit hard for us to understand because we think of jealousy from a human standpoint. The scripture warns that jealousy is not a good thing, that it is rooted in the sin nature. But for God to be jealous, given the fact that he has no sin, that he's holy and pure, there must be something very different there. You see, for usually us, in jealousy, it's rooted in our pride or our fear. That is, we want to be better than somebody else, or we're afraid they're better than us, so we want to take over whatever they have, and we're jealous of their position or possessions, whatever it might be. But God is not jealous of something in that way. Now, I think it's like this. 
Primarily, you and I were created for the purpose of knowing God, for walking with Him. This whole creation, this whole human life, this whole human experience is for the purpose of each of us to know Him intimately and personally. All the other things that happen in this world are distractions. And the longer you live, the closer you get to the reality of death, the more this should become a reality in your own life. That there is no other purpose under heaven or on earth other than knowing him. Everything else is secondary. And you see, if you are created for that purpose, then God is jealous for you because he loves you perfectly. See, his jealousy is rooted in his love. He wants you not to be distracted, not pulled away, not lured away particularly by the demonic or something that tempts you to sin, but rather he is jealous for relationship with you. And another way to look at that, if you look at the Hebrew word there that underlies the translation for the word jealous, is to substitute the word compare. In other words, he, does not want, he cannot be compared to any other god that there is no other who could even come close. And so the fact that God is a jealous God really is an extension of his love for each of us. Now it does say that there are consequences for having idols or worshiping something other than him because it says that he will punish the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and the fourth generation. Now, I really do believe that spiritual strongholds that are generational are a real pure reality. I've seen it many, many times in a lot of different families, a certain type of spiritual stronghold. And it's very easy for it to be cast to the third and the fourth generation. As I explained here a couple weeks ago, if you think about a, a period of four generations. Well, go back to your grandparents. Usually most of us know our grandparents. And they knew their grandparents pretty well. So now in between that level, see that would go back to your great-great-grandparents. In between that level, that's four generations. And how easy would it be for a grandparent to pass down to their child and their grandchild and then for it to continue for a couple more generations? You know, if you happen to have a great-great-grandparent who was consumed with greed, more than likely that would have affected the rest of the family and could easily be a stronghold that is showing up in your generation. And you see, if you, the Scripture says for those who hate him, if you worship things other than the true God and you invite these into your life and thereby invite them into your family, in essence, you're inviting them upon your descendants. Likewise, it says that he shows his love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. The fact is, many of us here are living on the blessings of our forefathers and mothers that came generations ago. In fact, I, I, I've mentioned a couple of times I've been doing some ancestry research in the latter months and, and have learned a lot. And, and I've learned that if I go back really anywhere between, say, five to ten generations, most all of my family immigrated from, from England or Ireland or something like that. So somebody made a decision many generations ago, a bold decision to leave their homeland and, and take a difficult journey and come to a land that was relatively unknown. And the consequence is a blessing upon which I live today. And you see, the reality is for, for all of us, if we could go back and, you know, I like doing this genealogical research, but what, what dis is disappointing is you can't talk to the people and really understand their lives. You just get, you know, they were born here and died there, and, you know. But I'd like to know about what was it that caused them to decide to take this journey. I'd especially like to know if, if one or probably more were led of the Lord, that they thought God was calling them into this new avenue. But you see, there are blessings that come from true worship, but there are consequences from false worship. Now, 
Exodus 23 says, you shall have no other gods before me. And this idea of creating idols or having no idols is certainly related to this commandment. And the fact is, any of us can create idols out of a lot of things. And I made a little list here. Like, for example, we tend to idolize people. It might be some famous person or it might be just a person. If you're a single person, it might be somebody you've met that has become an idol in your life because you so desperately want a relationship with them. Or you might idolize a position of power that you see where other people have influence and power and you think their lives are easier and you want in that. It might be money. I certainly think in our culture that money is an idol for many people. Somehow believing that it's an answer to life, that it will provide meaning in life, and, and even for some thinking that it will defer or allow them to avoid death. And I've, as I've said here in recent months, I think one of the enemies of people truly walking with Christ is this idol that we have of pleasure. That we like comfort, we like pleasure, and it diverts us from the serious walk of knowing Christ. It might be a position that you idolize, something that you think, boy, if I could just be in that role or have that title, then life would be good. It might be possessions. You know, as I said, you can sort of evaluate whether or not a possession is an idol by how it consumes your time, your resources, and so forth. And it also has to do with your affections. Like, for example... Uh, I know a lady that some years ago she got this really nice new car. It was probably the nicest car she'd ever had. It was sort of a luxury model. And I would say within two weeks, now she didn't see it happen, but she had it parked somewhere, and when she came out, there was this yellow stripe across the bumper. Now, it wasn't terrible. It didn't go all the way down the side of the car. But, I mean, this car was like maybe two weeks old and it had this yellow stripe across the bumper where obviously somebody in the parking lot had sort of veered and, and hit it and, and it must have been a yellow car and left that stripe on there. And it really upset her. Now, obviously, for most people, if it happened to your new car, you know, yeah. But now let's say you'd had the car for six years and, and uh, this occurred. In fact, I believe this is correct. You can help me here if I don't have the details right. But, but if you've ever been over to the parking lot in Kroger in Kingsport, you'll notice that it's not quite flat. And when uh, my kids were really small, my wife was there one time with them. This is correct. Didn't it? And she was like getting the groceries out of the cart and putting them in the car. And she was getting the kids out of the, you know, their little and so forth. And she goes back and the cart is gone. Isn't that right? And it rolled and hit somebody's car, right? That was your car? Have you, been, have you forgiven her for that? You're not holding anything there, are you? <laughs> but you had that happen. Well, we'll check the date just to see. <laughs> What year was that with you? Okay. <laughs> huh? Five. Oh, this was 15 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it really was. Mm. But anyway, so you hit this car with the right with the with the cart, and left a note. It put a dent in the car, didn't it? It did put a dent in the car. Did they call us? I can't remember. Oh, yeah, and insurance dealt with it. Yeah. I tried to forget, you see. <laughs> but the car just rolled through Kroger, hit somebody, put a dent in it. Now, now, if that had been you and you got in that car and you found a note from this sweet little lady and saying, look, I hit your car, sorry, you know. And now, if it had aroused your emotions and you had become irate, more than likely what? That car is an idol. If you looked at it and said, eh, we'll get it fixed. Or if you said, ah, who cares? In fact, I told this story before, but it's worth telling again. You see, I, I live on a dead-end street, and 
there's there are almost never any traffic there except for the paper person who comes really early in the morning, hardly ever see them, and, and then the mail person who comes sometime in the middle of the day. And, and so really, like, when, when I get out of my driveway, I have to back out to go into the road and then pull out, and you just back out and, you know, done it thousands of times. You sort of do it without thinking. And, and one day I backed out, and I was going, and I went, whoa, because I hit something behind me. And what happened was there was a young lady visiting our neighbor across the way, and instead of parking in front of their house, she had parked over in front of our house. I don't know why. And she had parked right at the place where our driveway comes out, and I had backed right into her car. And I was like, oh. I got out and looked. Now, this car was a little older and had a few dents in it, but it was clear that I'd put a new big dent in it <laughs> right in the fender. And I was like, oh. So I go over to my neighbor's house, I knock on the door, and say, oh, I've hit the car out here, you know. And, and, and so the young lady comes out, and she comes and looks at it, and I was showing her what I did. And she, this is the absolute truth. She said, oh, honey, don't worry about it. That's my ex-boyfriend's car. I don't care. <laughs> she really did. And I was like, you sure I want to pay for it? She said, no, his dad can knock it out. I don't care. In fact, you know, as the ex-boyfriend, I think she sort of liked it that I'd hopped him one more time, you know? Yeah, <laughs> back up and do it again. <laughs> you see, in her case, was that car an idol? No. Was that boyfriend an idol? No. She, she'd gotten over all that, you see? <laughs> yeah. But you see, really, you can measure whether or not something is an idol... But how strongly you want to hold on to it. In fact, uh, Roger Morell shared that, that he'd listened to a teaching by Andy Stanley. And Andy had decided that he would not buy anything unless he was willing to loan it out or give it away. In other words, he wasn't going to buy anything that he had to so hold on to that, that it could potentially become an idol. Which is a pretty good measure, a pretty good way to think. And see, now, you can also make an idol of yourself. In fact, in some ways, since we're born with a sin nature and we're naturally selfish, in some ways, all of us make idols of ourselves. But to the extent that I consider my needs, my values, more important than that of other people, in some ways, I'm an idol. Now, certainly, we can look in culture and find plenty of people who make idols of themselves. And you could also worship things that are not gods, that are demonic. Now, we don't think that we're going in those directions very obviously. We see things in other parts of the world, perhaps, that are more clear. In fact, if you were here when Aaron and Shoba Massey, they're the couple from India, were here, and I interviewed them. If you remember them, they have a ministry to temple prostitutes. Because in the city in which they live, there is this temple. I've seen pictures of it. It's a, it's a mass thing. There's a temple there, and it's a goddess that they worship. It's a part of Hindu worship. And literally, families come there and dedicate their daughters as temple prostitutes as a form of worship to that goddess. I tell you, what they are doing is dedicating their child to a demonic form of worship. That's what it is, because it's so destructive. And the ministry of the masses is to these ladies who are prostitutes, but primarily to their children. They have a home of about, I think it's 50 or 70 kids that they take care of, almost all of whom have been born to these temple prostitutes, but now live with them, and they're instructing them in Christ. But now, there are demonic things behind a lot of what occurs in society. And if you are not wise and discerning, you can easily end up worshiping something that is demonic. I mean, in, you know, in their case, what's going on there, there's some spirit of sexual perversion that is this goddess that has drawn people into this. Well, is there not a spirit of sexual perversion in our society that sometimes becomes an idol for people, certainly within the church as well as in society? And whether you realize it or not, you can, there can be something demonic behind it 
that is drawing you away from true worship. Now, the scripture says this in John. It says, God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. You see, go back to that little thing about a little child wants to, to emulate their parents. There's something in us that God has created whereby we naturally desire to worship. We are created to worship the true God. But you see, a lot of what we express as worship when it's towards some idol is false. It's towards something that really can have no value. You remember the story of when Moses was up uh, communing with God, getting the commandments that we've been talking about here, and then he comes back down to the people of Israel, and while he's been gone, they've thrown a big party. And what they have done is they have taken their gold and melted it down and created this false idol that they are now worshiping, something that they have created. And it's, it has no life. It has no power. What they happened is they have been deceived. Obviously, when Moses was communing with God, some spirit of Satan was deceiving the people. And, of course, Moses came down. He was very upset. But, you see, in their case, they were not worshiping in truth. And this happens a lot for modern people in any culture. That we are deceived into expressing our affection, our worship, for something that is not true. But true worship is for Christ and Christ alone. For he is the only one who has died to take away the sins of each one of us. He is the one who makes provision that you and I might have new life. He's the one who's created all things. The scripture says that not only did he create all things, but all things are held together through him and for him. That all of this creation is for the living God. And you see, part of the reason that we should come together in church fellowship and we should study is that each one of us should gain increasing truth, and as truth takes deeper root in our minds and in our souls, then it allows, it allows us to worship in truth. You know, I've said before, and it bears repeating, that anything that I say, I teach, you should sift. You should test to see if it's true, to see if the Holy Spirit confirms in your heart that it's true. And you see, as truth takes root in our soul, it draws us to worship the one true God. Not to be led away toward idols and, and false forms of worship. But there's a warning in Scripture. Back in Deuteronomy, in the same time frame where, where they were receiving the commandments and so forth, there's this warning where it says, Be careful, or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. Now, if I were honest, I would say I've probably had at least 50 different idols in my life. In other words, if I think back through my life, things that consume my attention, I've probably had more than 50 idols. I mean, I can think back to when I was a little kid and maybe there was a toy that was an idol that I didn't want anybody else to touch. You see what I'm saying? Or I can remember certain sports figures that were uh, extraordinary in my mind when I was a little kid and I sort of had them as an idol. Or maybe it was something, some possession that I gained later. But you see, if, I, if I'm honest and I think about the experiences of life, I've had many of them. And they all ended up empty, insufficient. And obviously, in this teaching, the critical question is what? Is there anything in my life today that is an idol? Anything that so consumes my mind, my attention, that it draws me away from the true God. You know, I've been in 
situations, and you have two, where you can easily see the idols of other persons, how they act about things and so forth. It's a little harder to see your own idols. In other words, what you may think you have in balance, somebody else may realize, "Mm, I believe that's consuming too much of your life. And see, this warning, this was given to the people in the Old Testament, but go all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, and this is at the point of judgment where the plagues are being poured out, and it says, look, that, that many, many, much of mankind has been destroyed by plagues, and it says, even then, that they did not stop worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Even in the context of judgment, people were still worshiping things or will be still worshiping things that are not true. And see, what's the danger in this? It's almost like you say, okay, well, you had an idol. What's the big deal? It robs you of life. I mean, to the extent that it it takes and consumes your life and takes you away from true life, it undermines your very existence. Let's say, for example, that my job is an idol. That is, that I didn't mean to say my job, but after I thought about it, well, some pastors, their job is an idol for them. They, they love that position. But that could be true for any position. That you love the, the recognition that you receive and the, the pay that you receive and and the respect and the title and so forth. Anybody's job could be an idol. And if it really becomes an idol, what's going to happen is you're going to invest most of your attention and your life into that to the extent that you might neglect your spouse or your children or other members of your family. You might neglect your health. There are a lot of things that might suffer if your job is an idol. And you see, if that's the case, it is robbing you of real life. Anything that is an idol robs you of real life. That's why I entitled this, look, there's only one. There's only one true focus of worship. Everything else is a deception. It's false. And only you, in conjunction with the Holy Spirit speaking to you, can come to realize what, if anything, in your life is an idol. And sometimes it's very subtle. I mean, maybe, for example, you've been a good parent, you've invested a lot in your your children, and you want to see their lives go well, and and, uh, you have a certain vision about how things should go, and then things start to go differently, ways that you didn't plan And it's really frustrating you, and you're really upset. And if you really seep down into your heart and try to understand what's going on, what's happened is you've made their future your idol. And you have to let go of it. I mean, sometimes people make their own family their idol, that it's got to be perfect, and everybody has to perform in a certain way. And that's what I mean by you can be deceived and subtly develop an idol without even knowing that's what you're doing. So let's pray together. And really my prayer is this, that the Lord would speak to each of our hearts about anything that might be an idol in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, I do ask that your spirit would be upon us, that you would show us anything that really is standing in the way of true worship of you. Any idol that we've made of a possession or of another person, maybe even of a place or some position that we idolize in work or other settings. Maybe we've made idols of our own children. Lord, anything that deceives us away from true worship, I pray that we would lay those before you 
surrender them. That we might have a heart that worships in spirit and truth. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.